Chapter 12. Unexpected Consequences Rolling out of bed Monday morning, I shuffle into the bathroom to relieve myself. I don't feel very rested. My shoulders are stiff and sore, as if I've been sleeping on a rock. Yawning, still blurry-eyed, I put a steadying hand on the wall, trying not to fall over. The TV is still on, adverts by the sound of it. I wonder what time it is. I looked at my phone when I first woke, but I couldn't make out what the screen said. It was too blurry. Flushing the to- toilet, I start to pull off my clothes. I need to shower. After washing myself down under the hot, fast-flowing water, I step out and wrap a towel round myself, tucking the end over at the waist. Good morning. Here is the news at seven o'clock, purrs the female newsreader on the TV. Grabbing a second towel, I start rubbing my hair and step out of the bathroom. Getting back to work will help distract me from the nightmare weekend, make life feel normal again. I need to read the script before filming begins today to help get my head back in the game. As the newsreader starts to open with the lead story, my ears prick up, my hands freezing mid-rub. The London Fire Brigade is at the famous Pinewood Studios this hour, battling a devastating blaze that has been tearing through the film studio since late last night, she says. Here's Tom Marshall at the scene for us. Tom. I drop the towel from my head and stare at the screen in shock, suddenly interested in what she has to say, as they cut to live feed from outside the studios. When firefighters were called to the scene last night, the fire had already taken hold. There are more than ten crews here at the moment, and as you can see, they are still fighting to bring this blaze under control. When they eventually get a handle on it and the fire is out, investigators can move in, Tom says, gesturing at the heavy flames and the firefighters in the background behind him. There appears to be numerous buildings engulfed in flames, potentially putting the Hollywood-backed film that is currently under production here in jeopardy. Although there is no word yet on how this fire started, given how widespread the fire is, this may be more than a simple accident. There are several fire trucks visible in the background, with their blue lights flashing and numerous firefighters dotted about, hosing down the orange flames that are reaching into the early morning sky, filling it with clouds of black smoke. There is no word on whether anyone was at the studio at the time the fire began, the reporter goes on, but due to the intensity of the fire, crews have been unable to get inside the buildings. Oh my God. I sink down onto the corner of the bed, the towel in my hands nearly falling on the floor as shock sets in. There I was looking forward to getting back to work. Now what? My tummy rumbles, reminding me that I need to eat something. I quickly finish drying myself and put on some clothes before running the comb through my hair and turning off the TV. Just as I'm considering my next course of action, there's a knock on the door. It's me, Ryan's voice calls faintly from the other side of the door. I open the door and smile faintly at him. Hey, Roy, you heard about the fire? Yeah, Rollins has been in touch, Ryan says, looking troubled. Have you heard from him? I shake my head. He's been in touch with the brass. Apparently the fire is limited to the sound stage where filming for a commercial took place over the weekend and it shouldn't really impact our schedule. But obviously no one can turn up until the fire's out for safety, he says. Feeling relieved, I nod. The reporters on the news are exaggerating then, I say. He nods at me with a smile. You want to go get some breakfast? I'd love to, I agree, turning to fill my pockets with my wallet and stuff. He waits patiently while I shove my wallet, keys, phone and other stuff into my pockets, making sure I have my key card before exiting the room, pulling the door closed behind us. I glance up and down the quiet hotel corridor before following Ryan towards the lift. I'm so hungry, I can't wait to eat something. It's all I can think about as we ride the slow, steady lift down to the lobby. Finally, it jerks to a halt at the bottom and the door slide open. The suddenness of the stop always makes me queasy. That's what I hate the most about this lift. Ryan follows me into the quiet restaurant and lines up behind me at the counter. I select juice and a hot breakfast, paying the cashier before heading to a table in the far corner of the room. The food smells good. I can't wait to tuck in. After a moment, Ryan joins me at the table. My plate is filmed with steaming hash brown, bacon, eggs, beans, tomato, sausage and some toast. I slice parts of it up and shovel a combination of all of it into my mouth without stopping to admire the delicious food. Mmm, a good breakfast sets you up for the day. Any idea what we're supposed to do? 
I ask after swallowing, the next mouthful on my fork poised halfway between my plate and my lips. Just sit around and wait for the phone to ring, maybe. Ryan shrugs, glancing up from his plate, his fork also halfway to his mouth. Don't know, mate. Graham didn't really specify. Shoving the fork into my mouth, I think it over for a minute. You know, we could drive over there anyway, I say. It's a good two-hour run, right? Hmm, Ryan agrees, mid chew Maybe by the time we get there, we'll be in business, if we're lucky. Or at least we can see how things are. I pause and take a drink of my apple juice. Worst case scenario, we kill the morning in Uxbridge. There is a hint of a smile on his lips as he nods in agreement again. Sure, sounds better than sitting around here. Sure does, I agree, returning to my breakfast. I soon polished off the plate of food in no time. Sitting back in my chair, I feel satisfied but not over full and reach for my juice. Ryan is still only about halfway through his breakfast, having chosen to eat at a more leisurely pace than me. After draining my juice, I reach into my pocket for my phone, intending to check Twitter, but then I remember I'm avoiding social media at the moment. Instead, I pat my pockets down for the stumpy pencil I often have on me, noticing the clean paper napkins on the table. Pushing my plate aside, I spread out one of the napkins and glance them round the room for inspiration. There is a small group of pretty and very smartly dressed young women seated at a table a few feet away in the centre of the room. Perfect. I decide to sketch the redhead, who is the one seated facing mostly towards me, and quickly outline the shape of her arm and face, followed by her shiny, flowing Irish red locks. Glancing up again, I accidentally catch her eye. Not wanting her to think I am staring, I quickly look away again and stencil, stencil her thin nose onto the napkin, then her sharp eyeliner highlighted eyes. I draw her lips in the shape of the slight smile she wore when our eyes met, and then dare to glance at her again. My attention has not escaped her notice. Even though she is not looking at me this time, both her companions are. Drawing softer lines over the sketch in order to soften her features, I realise Ryan is watching me draw. She's coming over, Ryan's voice whispers, sounding like it's coming over his shoulder. I look up, surprised to find myself looking into the woman's bright green eyes. Hi, she smiles, her eyes moving to the napkin on the tabletop. I couldn't help Notice you have been staring. Her voice trails off as my face fills with colour. It sounds like my observation about her heritage was spot on. She has a strong Irish accent. I'm sorry, I gasp, feeling embarrassed. She, she quickly moves round to stand behind me, leaning over my shoulder to examine my artwork. Is that me? She gasps. I look up into her. Now much closer face, biting my lip and trying to work out if she's pleased or offended. I hope you don't mind. I gush the words coming out in a rush. It, I was just, it's a hobby of mine. Oh my God, the woman explain, exclaims, her eyes going from the napkin to my face as she lifts it. Wow. Her eyes are wired and I, I still can't tell if she is pleased by it or not. I'm sorry. I scratch the side of my neck grimacing. No, this is amazing, she gushes, putting hand on my arm. I watch her urgently beckon her companions over. Look at this, she squeals at them, her face a picture of ecstasy as she waves the napkin in their faces. Isn't it good? Still feeling embarrassed, I exchange a look with Ryan. He, on the other hand, is highly amused and biting down on a grin, trying not to laugh. The other women also exclaim in admiration and agree that I'm an artistic wonder, saying how much it resembles her, but unlike her, they are not Irish. Wait, my doodle subject says, frowning at me suspiciously. Don't I know you from somewhere? I swallow, hoping if she remembers who I am, it won't blow up in my face. I'm not exactly boy band popular at the minute. Possibly, I smile at her, my discomfort probably plain to see. She looks towards Brian, her eyes narrow further as she tries to nail down the familiarity. You're Ryan Ackle, aren't you? The redhead finally questions. That's right, he gives her a friendly smile. And Michael Miller, she adds, turning back to me with no doubt now. Yes, I say tentatively, and hope she's not going to hold it against me. Sharon McGillis, she gasps, looking more excited than she did moments ago. It's a pleasure to meet you both. I get to my feet, accepting her outstretched hand and gently shaking it, smiling at her enthusiasm. The pleasure's all mine, Miss McGillis, I purr, relaxing a little. 
Shannon giggles childishly, bending at the knees and bouncing on them slightly in excitement, before turning to Ryan and shaking his hand to Lucy. Shannon's raven head companion says, shaking my hand weakly, with no hint of enthusiasm, not even a friendly smile. I nod in acknowledgement, shaking her hand. Her greeting is lukewarm at best, and I get a niggling feeling that she looks familiar, but I can't put my finger on it. It's not nice to meet you, Ryan says. Shelley, the dark-skinned brunette, smiles, leaning round the other two to reach my hand. Can I keep this? Shannon asks, clutching the napkin to her chest, a grin still plastered on her face. Of course, I smile. Can I just ask one more thing of you? Shannon says, pressing her lips together and inverting them between her teeth. Would you be so kind as to sign this for me? Sure, I laugh. She holds it out to me. I take it and bend over the tabletop, scrawling my name in one of the bottom corners of the napkin. Then I decide to go one better and pencil her name along the top. What's the date today? I question, a frown creasing my forehead as I try to remember. Sixth of July, Shelley pipes up. I glance at the women before writing the date across the bottom. Thanks. Did you say this is just a hobby? Shannon says. I can tell from her tone that she doesn't quite believe that. Yes, indeed. I straighten up a horn and hold out the napkin to her. Here you go. Well, I'm going to frame this and treasure it, she gushes. Thank you so much, Michael. Nobody has ever drawn me before. I smile and cast my eyes towards the floor, feeling embarrassed by her manner. You're very welcome. I smile at the carpet. I guess if you hadn't made it as an actor, it's nice to know you have a fallback, huh? Shelley says. That's funny. I've never considered art as a career choice, but it's nice to know I have talent. Actually, if I hadn't fallen into acting, I'd probably still be fixing motors, I say, looking up at her. I used to be a mechanic. Really? Shannon says curiously. Oh yeah, I can dismantle a car engine, clean it, put it back together, change the brakes, shoes, the oil, you name it. Shannon looks me over in amazement. You are just full of surprises, she gasps, smiling back at me. I haven't failed to notice the way Lucy has been staring at me wordlessly this whole time. I've been paying most attention to Shannon, but the look on her companion's face has been getting more and more hostile. Now she's staring daggers at me. Well, we'd better get back to our breakfast, Shannon sighs. We have to get to work. OK, I smile at them, my expression changing as my eyes flicker Lucy's way warily. Yeah, us too, Ryan says. Shannon and Shelley move back to their table, but Lucy does not. I always thought of you as a nice guy, she says, scowling intently at me. How could you? The other two women stop moving and turn towards their friend. Have we met before? I frown thoughtfully at her, still trying to place her. Here it comes, though. Never mind if we've met before or not. I know what's coming. She's about to accuse me, isn't she? It'll either be about the rape or that policewoman, or Eve. Lucy, no, don't you dare, Shannon hisses, staring at her wide-eyed and grabbing her arm. Shush. I guess she's thinking the same thing as I am. Nice to know we're all on the same page. No, Shan, it'll bother me if I walk away without saying anything, Lucy cries, turning back to me. What you did to Kelly LaHare is outrageous. How could you? Lucy is staring at me harder than ever now, as if I have wronged her. Kelly? I gasp, shock running through me. This is about Kelly? Shannon stares at her in horror. Instead of feeling relief that she is not bringing up any of the things I thought she would, I feel nauseous, the memories of Kelly washing through my head like a bad dream. Kelly explained, Shannon starts to say, but Lucy cuts her off. Kelly has barely slept all week, Lucy growls, the words coming out through her teeth, each one shaking with fury. She has to take painkillers all the time, and the other day I caught her crying, it hurts so much. The guilt I feel about that deepens with every word, as if she's rubbing it in on purpose. I didn't mean to hurt her, I say, my voice quiet, my eyes dropping to the soft, red-coloured carpet. Then my brain catches up with my emotions a little, and I look up into her furious eyes, swallowing nervously. Wait, you know her? I question, somewhat hesitantly. Lucy shakes off Shannon's hand and takes a step towards me. I'm her sister, Lucy growls.